morning. Good morning, church. It is good to see you. You guys are looking very good this morning, I must say. So we're getting right at that place, right? We're almost at that place of capacity. It means you guys got to sign up. It means you might have to, if you don't mind sitting next to somebody, you, you need to sit next to somebody next week. Uh, you might want to get here a little earlier, all that kind of stuff. All that kind of, you know, it's all good. It's all good. So I hope you, I hope you are good. Uh, one team, one fight. One team, one fight. So I, uh, I'm in the United States Air Force as a chaplain with the Air National Guard, and I got to hear that uh, statement for the first time, I think, I mean, I may have heard it before, but when I was doing a, a mission for about a week, two weeks, an ongoing mission, I was filling in for another chaplain in the city called Empire Shield. Those are the ones where you, if you go to the airport or any of the train stations, you see the military guys, that's Empire Shield. And... Uh, why they say one team, one fight is because in the services, so I'm in the Air Force, and, and actually in the Air Force, we make fun of everybody else because they're not in the Air Force. And then, and then the Army makes fun of us, but they make fun, everybody makes fun of the Marines, everybody makes fun of the Navy, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? So we all make fun of each other, right? But what's really cool is not only on that mission, but now, you know, again with the COVID mission, so I get to chaplain Air Force people, but also not only Air Force, but Army, Navy, Marines, and then even what's called the New York Guard. I didn't even know it existed until about a year ago, and that is a volunteer militia. And uh, they kind of fill in some. There you go. And uh, so I get, to, I get to chaplain them all. Not really pastor, but chaplain them all, right? And so when we're on mission together, it's one team, one fight. One team, one fight. We'll make fun of each other, and we'll laugh at each other, and we'll do all that kind of stuff. But when it comes to the mission, we're all on the mission for the same purpose. Uh, about a year ago, so at our, at our 30th wedding anniversary, Danielle and I, as a couple, turned 30 last October. And um, I began saying it to her, one team, one fight. And so uh, um, we, we actually, you know, we're so cool as a couple. You know, we, get, we have hashtags. You know, whenever we do something, we've always put McCarty on the, McCarty's on the move. And now our new one is the, it, the adventure continues, and it con continues it together, right? So we've been married 30. We want to be married 60 or plus, and, and it's all going to be together. And uh, one team, one fight. And, and that's really important because, you know, when everything's lovey-dovey, it feels like one team, one fight. And when everything's not so lovey-dovey, can I get an amen from a married couple, please? Right? Right? When it's not always lovey-dovey, it's it's, sometimes it's not real easy to remember that we're one team, one fight, that we're ready to go. Right? So now apply that to the church. Now apply that to the church. Listen, if you've, if you've been in church any period of time, uh, in, in different churches or whatever, if, 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 if you love Jesus and you've been in those kind of places, you know that it's hard Right? I mean, we're all about one team, one fight. So we have, we have a mission statement, exalting Christ and pointing others to him. That's what we're all about here, right? Uh, until somebody wants something. Not, not different in the mission statement, but different happening. And sometimes, even in churches, even in churches where we love Jesus with all of our heart, like we do here at Grace, we can forget that we're on the same team, walking to the same purpose. Why? Because we're, we're different people. Right? And, and what I love about this is you look out around this room right now and there's all kind of people with all kind of shades and different hair and some with hair and some without hair. We, I got that. Leave me alone. <laughs> Amen. Uh, you know, but different looks. Different, you know, God makes us all different. Right? And, and I love that. I love the diversity of God of how he, he, he paints so beautifully in different colors. And in different shades and in different kind of personalities and different kind of giftings and all that kind of stuff. And sometimes you can forget that it's one team, one fight. Sometimes we can forget that we're on the same team. I mean, uh, you know, you've heard the jokes. And uh, I've never lived this, but in the, my first church as a young pastor, I heard this had happened way before I had gotten there. Uh, they actually, one of their longest congregational meetings they had, which was hours long, was because they had to change the color of the car, you know, they had to change the carpet, and they, they began fighting about carpet, and they began fighting, you know, and that just leads to other things, right? How can we get so wrapped up 
in a decoration or, or a practical thing, right? And, and forget that we're on the same team. One team, one fight. Yet it happens, right? So now we've been preaching through the book of Galatians. We only have three more weeks, counting this week. So Father's Day will be the last week in the book of Galatians. Uh, we've been here since February. It's been an awesome, just an awesome study. For me personally, it's been just a, a, a treasure and a joy to, to go through it. And, and you remember the, the main thrust of, of the book of Galatians Right, is freedom in Jesus Christ, and specifically freedom from trying to earn my salvation some other way. There's no other way that I can earn my salvation. I can't do it by being religious. I can't do it by being right. I can't do it by, by trying really hard, because the reality of it is, your good enough is not good enough. God's requirement for heaven is perfection, and all of us fall short of the glory of God. All of us. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. That's what we're told in Scripture. And, and all we need is experience to say, yeah, that's me. I don't, I don't deserve. So what do you have left, right? We've talked about this for many, 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 many weeks, almost the same sermon every week for a long time, of, of what do I have left? I have nothing left. All I have left is to fall upon the mercy and the grace of a loving God who sent Jesus Christ to, to die in my place. And that by believing and trusting in that alone, not on trying to be good enough, not on trying to earn something before God, but simply falling upon his mercy and grace by trusting in that alone, am I saved? And, and, and then redeemed and then identified with him and then born again and then born into his family. So we become his children and, and all of those good things that we have of God. And you remember the problem in the churches of Galatia was the fact that people had come in, people they called Judaizers. They were, they were people from, from uh, um, Israel who were coming in. Galatia was, was in modern-day Turkey. It, it was not a Jewish church. It was a Gentile church that had trusted in Jesus Christ as their Savior. And so very few Jews, if any, were in that church. And yet people had come in and said, yes, you have to believe in Jesus, but you also have to be Jewish in a sense. You have to follow the law. You have to be circumcised. You have to follow the dietary law. You have to do all these things, you know, checklist, checklist, check, check mark, check mark, to be right before God, and they had begun to believe it, and so you remember way back in February, where we looked at chapter one, only six chapters, I, I don't go quick all the time, and uh, right, six chapters, but he, he starts out with, I, I can't even believe that you have so quickly abandoned the gospel that saved you, and that gave you freedom, and that gave you mercy and grace, and now you want to grab hold of, of something to try to earn something? Before God, I can't believe that you've done that. So I want you to imagine, you know, we just sung, I can only imagine, and that's a beautiful song, right? And our, our worship team always does a great job. So um, um, I want you to imagine in this church the, the kind of turmoil that brought. Just, I mean, we, we don't often think about it, and Paul doesn't necessarily write about it, although I have a feeling that this is what he's talking about when we're talking about this week, and, and even why he's been talking about being free in Jesus Christ to the point where I don't, I don't have to worry about others, but I'm free to love them, right? I'm free to love them in, in a way that is unobstructed by me. And uh, so imagine when, when these people come in and dis disrupt, and some people are like, no, and some people are like, yes, and some begin to believe, and some are struggling to, you know, to, to, to go that way, and it, and it causes a rift. And now Paul has come in, and he's about to send this letter that is going to bring a hammer down, if you will, right? I mean, if it was anything, boy, Paul just put the hammer down. And he needed to because we cannot lose the gospel. You cannot lose what the gospel of Jesus Christ is. That it is by grace through faith alone to for salvation. And so Paul comes in and brings the hammer down. And, and so people are about to, you know, because he's writing a letter, they're about to be corrected by the apostle and about to be told the truth and how they're straying and what to do with these Judaizers. And you can go back and listen to all 12 weeks or whatever we preach of that. To talk about that. Um, but, but what happens with the church after that? 
What happens to the church after that? Well, I could imagine it could pretty easily begin to fracture and, and argue and fight. And, and even those who were right begin to put down those who were wrong. You know, in that, right? So you, you, you begin to see what, what could be. And so Paul needs to remind them, and that's why he's, where he's gone in, in the last half of chapter 5 and through chapter 6, why he now gets to personal relationships and, and how we deal with those and really how we deal with, with people in Jesus Christ, right? Because we are in this together. We're the church. And we're not out for our cause. This is not about us. This is not about Patrick McCarty's church. You, you know, I, I, when I first moved to the island 12 years ago, uh, the one thing I noticed was that many churches, when people talked about what church did you go to, they would talk about, oh, I went to Pastor Such and Such's church, and I went to Pastor Such and Such's. This is not Patrick McCarty's church. This is not Patrick McCarty's church. This is Jesus Christ's church. That's why, you know, we got a new sign several years ago. My name's not on the sign, and it never will be. Because this isn't my church. All right, this is our church. We are in this together. We are the church. Right? And we are the local church. We're the local church gathered here. And this is who we are. And, and so we need to be identified by Christ and by who we are in Christ for all of that. And so, and so like I said, because of all of this, because of all this issue, and what's, what's going on is we can, we can very quickly stop being identified in Christ alone and start being identified by labels and other kinds of things. And uh, when we do that, we get lost. When we, when we do that, we get lost in, in who we are in Christ. And that, and that includes in the church and out of the church and all those things. But, but we've got to remember, like I said, we've got to remember who we are. Because our, our worth is not wrapped up. So even as the gospel doesn't earn, you know, it doesn't earn us anything before God to do good works, God wants us to do good works, right? But not to somehow gain his favor. It is out of the love that he has given us that we serve because of who we are, not to be what we're not. Because we become new creations in Christ, right? And so um, when we get wrapped up in that, we, we can really mess up. And so thus Paul presses in and, and wants us to press in. This is chapter 5, right? He wants us to press in so closely to Jesus Christ. You know, look at your fruit. What's being produced in your life. And you remember last week I said that the answer to the fact that we're not producing well for Jesus, right? So the deeds of the flesh are evident. Again, you can go back and listen to this sermon last week. And the deeds of the Spirit, the, the fruit of the Spirit is evident. And, and when I'm not getting the fruit of the Spirit, but I'm doing the deeds of the flesh because I'm still, right, the angel devil, I'm still caught in this fight about what is good and, and bad, what is, well, it's okay this time, but it's not okay. And, right, we have this internal struggle going on, the flesh versus the Spirit that is within me, the Spirit of Jesus Christ. If you've expect, accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, he takes residence up in you. The Spirit of God is within you. And so we have this fight between the flesh and the spirit in us. And, and when, when we're getting caught in something, the answer is not stop. Now, I, I know the answer is stop, right? But the real answer is I, I'm not pressing into Jesus enough. The real answer is that my, my outward activities show my heart. Jesus once said about speaking, he says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when, so when you say to your spouse in that moment when you forget that you're one team, one fight, and you say something that you go, oh, I didn't mean to say that. You know, later on when you're, when you're sorry, Jesus says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now, do me a favor, couples, do not use that in an argument later on. Because I know you'd be like, you did mean to say that. Um, don't do that. Don't do that. But the problem is, if something comes out of me that shouldn't, the reality is it was inside of me. 
And, and, and the reality is, is that Christ is not enthroned in my life enough. And so I need to press into him. And praise God, he gives grace and forgiveness. And praise God, I, you know, because what the, Satan wants to do is, oh, look, you're no good, you're no good, you're no good, you're no good. And God says, and, and, the, and the answer to that is what? You're right, I'm no good. That's why I need Jesus. I do need Jesus. It's just an evidence of the fact that I need Jesus Christ more in my life. And so, so we talked about that last week, the fruit of the Spirit. And so now he wants to get into, I think, probably dealing with what's about to come in this church where there have been those who have strayed away from the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and how do we deal with that? So if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to open up to the book of Galatians chapter 6. If you have your phone with a Bible app on there, open up to the book of Galatians. If you don't have a Bible at all, there should be a Bible on those buffer seats right there. Uh, should be at least two Bibles in every row. Take that out. If you do not have a Bible at home, if you don't have a Bible at home, please keep that. We want you to have that. All right? I know you got your phone and all that, but if you want a paper Bible for home and you can read that small print, it is all yours. If Kyle thinks it's fine, and if you knew Kyle, you know why, it's fine. Anyway, all right. Kyle has a hard time seeing, so if he can see it, anybody can see it, right, Kyle? That's what your point is. All right. All right, so what we're going to do is we're just going to walk through this passage, right? We're just going to talk through it because I think Paul is building an argument here. And, and you'll see, I, I think it could be, and this is Patrick's opinion, all right? I think it could be based on kind of the issue that's, that's going on, swirling around it. But it applies in every area of the church, of how we interact with one another. So look at what he says. Ephesians, I mean Ephesians, Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, he says this. Brethren... Even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. All right, so he's dealing with personal relationships in the church, specifically, or among Christians. And I think, uh, I, I got to tell you, if, if there's one area, I mean, there's probably a few, but boy, Personal relationships, maybe, maybe more than anyone other one else, shows your spiritual maturity, right, and your spiritual growth in Jesus Christ and shows whether what your real character is that comes out. And again, I'm not talking about when, when we're singing the song. You know, I'm not talking about when the band is playing and it's really beautiful and, and we're just, you know, praise God and we look over at that person that we've had some struggle and we smile and we give them a smile. Ah, oh, praise God. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when... Maybe especially when, you know, it's a little tense, especially when you don't agree with somebody on something, especially when they're different than you and they act different and they have, they have different thoughts. Believe it or not, in the church of Jesus Christ, we have different thoughts. It's amazing. It's amazing. We have, we have different thoughts on everything. We have different political views. We have different social things. Some people will go to some movies. Some people won't. Some people will do certain activities. Some people won't. Some people will love the beach. Some people don't. I know you, well, you live on island, Long Island. Why don't you love the beach? I don't love the beach. It's got sand on it, and sand gets everywhere. I don't know how you, and, and by the way, you know, like you who are blessed with more melanin than I, you know, which is just about everybody in this place. Um, you know, going to the beach, I, I don't get tan. I just get red. And some of you are like, well, well, I get red, and then two days later it turns into tan. No, mine just turns into red. So all that happens. So I slather everything in sunscreen, no matter what, all the time. Uh, you know, so we're all different. We're all different. And, and how we interact and deal with each, each other, uh, maybe especially on, on areas where it's tense. And areas where there's conflict, and then maybe even areas where there's sin involved, really reveal our character and show us who we are. And so, and so Paul says, what do you do with those who are caught in sin? How, how do you, with, with those who have gone away from God's truth or, 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 or been wrapped up and ensnared in sin, what do you do with those? So get this. So Christians, um, often what we do is is this, right? I don't, I don't want to deal with it. 
I don't want to deal with it. Some of you call me and say, Pastor, you deal with it. Uh, and then if you've called me and done that, you know I tell you, no, you go deal with it because you're the one who's seen the behavior or whatever. But, right, we, we don't want to deal with it. We want to close our eyes. We want somebody else to deal with it. We'll go off and pray for them. You know, so oftentimes, but Christians are not to avoid that. Matter of fact, that is not love. Love is not letting somebody go off the rails into the bushes and, and into certain disaster and, and us just go, oh, that's a real shame. I liked him or I liked her. That, that's not love. That's not love, right? Love is, is going and grabbing them and doing everything you can to pull them back. So Christians are not to avoid the situation, but they're also not to openly expose it. They're also not to, like, pick up the phone, or, and it's not the phone anymore, right? Now it's the text chain, you know, and tell everybody. And how we do it in the church, you know how we, you know how we gossip in the church? You know, we pray for them. That's right. You know, pray for, pray for I don't even know. Julio. I don't think we have a Julio in our church. You know, pray for Julio. He's, he's off the rails, you know, and he did this and that to me. Can you believe? Can you believe what he said? You know? But we're praying for him. We're going to pray for him. You know, right? so we're not to openly expose it. Instead, we're to do something about it. What are we to do? All right? So um, look at what he says. So first we need to realize what he's saying. When it says... Um, in verse 1 in the beginning, brethren, if anyone is caught in any sin, that does not mean that, oh, if you walked around the corner and caught them in sin. That's not what he's talking about there. What he's talking about is if somebody is ensnared or entrapped in sin. All right? In, in other words, if, if they've been caught by sin and it's grabbed them and kept them. So get you, it, it's not about you being the sin police, walking around and going, what, what, did I just hear a slight version of a curse word out of your mouth? You know, that's not what he's talking about. That is not what he's, he's not talking about you being the sin police or you being the morality police or something like that. As a matter of fact, we need to give grace. When, when something falls on your toe heavy, something's coming out of your mouth. And by the grace of God, hopefully it's like, you know, hamburgers. I don't know. I don't know what your word is, right? I mean, if somebody drops something heavy on their foot and a, not a nice word comes out, give them a little break, right? Be, you'll be, have a little patience. They don't need you to beat up on them. They've already been beat up on, right? So we don't need, that's not what it's walking about. But if, but if you find somebody who is ensnared in sin, so this is unrepentant sin. This is a sin where they're walking away and beginning to get carried away, if you will, by, by what's happening. For this church, it was, they were beginning to believe a falsehood about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and probably some other stuff too. And he, and he might be talking about some other stuff too. But he says, listen, if you, if you get with those, if you see somebody, then he says, you who are spiritual. I like that one. So some of you are like, um, uh, well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the pastor, so I shouldn't be doing that. See, pastor, he's talking about you doing that. No, that's not what it's saying either. What he's saying is, if you can recognize that sin, if you're, if you're not trapped in sin, right, if you're walking with Christ, you who are spiritual are to restore those who are caught in sin, right? We're to, we're to love on them, those who are not ensnared and trapped. We're to love them enough to grab them. And that doesn't mean you don't go get help if you need it, but, but you grab them and you love them enough Right, I, I've said this often when I had little kids. You know, if, if, when, my, when my boys were young, um, we actually lived on a road that was a pretty busy road. I mean, it, was, it wasn't a main road. It was a side road, but it was a pretty busy road. And, and I said, listen, if you're at my house and my son goes and runs out in the middle of the street, I don't need you to come find me. That's not loving. Loving is not like, oh, man, I can't believe... Uh, one of those McCarty boys is playing in the street again. Can you believe that? Hey, hey, Sally, look, the McCarty boy's playing. I don't need you to do that. I don't need you to go, oh, man, that kid needs prayer. I'm going to pray for that child. That's not the loving thing to do at that moment. The loving thing to do is to walk out in the middle of the street, pick them up. That's why, they, that's why God makes kids small. I'm convinced of that. Because when they need to be moved, you can move them. Right? And so you pick them up, and you bring them inside, and you say, Patrick or Danielle, here's your kid. They were playing in the middle of the street. Now, why don't we do that? Because sometimes the parents like, I told them they could play. Leave me alone. 
You know, or, or like, why are you bothering with my kid? Because this is the kind of society we're in today, right? Well, I'll tell you what, you, you, be loving. So when someone's walking off, even when they say, hey, mind your own business, you can say, Pastor McCarty said, this is my business. Your walking away from the gospel of Jesus Christ is my business. It's your business, it's my business. Because I love you. Because I love you. So... We're to do what? We're to restore such a one, it says. Now, that word restore is a great word. It's a verb that's used as a medical term that is used in the Greek for setting a fracture. And I love that word, right? So we're to take that which is broken and make it right again. That's why doctors, when you go to a doctor and you think you're bone, they take an x-ray. They might even take an MRI. They might take a, you know, depending on what they need to do because they need to see what's going on so that they can align it correctly. Well, we're to be people who help others to align back, not to us, but to Jesus. Back to what is right and what is in Jesus Christ. And how are we to do that? We're to do it with gentleness. Uh, uh, see, that's the, that's the word that's really hard for most of us. Because, because unrepentant sin makes us upset. And, and even if we love them, it really makes us upset. And what we really want to do is we want to go snatch them out of the street. I don't know about you, but um, I've been guilty of, of even when my kids were really young and honestly didn't know any better. Right? They saw the big kids run, run into the street to get the ball or whatever. And, and they're too immature to understand they got to look and they just don't data, dash out there and all that kind of stuff. Right? But I, I've been guilty of going and just grabbing them up and being angry with them. To the point, even when they didn't know, right, if they did know, then that's a discipline issue. But even when they didn't know and, and being angry and just, and just wailing, not wailing, but, you know, like being upset with them and mad at them and yelling. And you can't do that. What's wrong with you? I've seen parents yell at little kids who have no idea. And, and I was convicted greatly when, when someone shared with me. You know, be before you tell your children, no, you, you have to explain what's right. You know, they don't, they don't necessarily, we're not born with an innate ability to know what's right and what's wrong. We just watch somebody else do it. And, and they, they can't tell the difference, right? So we're to do it with gentleness, with, with grace, with mercy, with love. Um, the same way that God deals with us. It doesn't mean that God doesn't spank every once in a while, right? But he does it out of love. And he never does it to hurt, and he never does it to crush. God never, never allows things, you know, we, we'll walk our way sometimes, and God, I think a lot of God's discipline is him just saying, okay, then you have the consequences of it. And it, it's not because God doesn't love us. He, he loves us. He wants us to see that that's the error of our ways and to look back to, to, to what's true. And so when we do that, when, when, when he allows that to happen, right, it's not out of love, it's out of grace, but he is constantly patient with us, constantly gentle with us. Matter of fact, if you go back just a, a few verses up to the fruit of the Spirit, what, is it, what comes out of me? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, faithfulness. Right? They're, they're, it, it doesn't mean that you don't go and snatch them out of the road. But it means you love on them the whole time. It means you walk next to them. It means that you help them in everything that they're doing. That's what you do. So not, not to be done in some sort of look at me or I'm higher than. As a matter of fact, look at where he goes. That's what he does. Verse 2. He says, bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. And, and, and I forgot that, that, that the, the statement right above that, which is be careful so that you're not tempted yourself. As a matter of fact, to not be tempted to allow first the flesh to own you at that moment because that's what happens, right? When we get mad at somebody because they're not doing the right thing, doesn't the flesh tend to own us at that moment? It, it's a big verse for me, James chapter 1. 
I, I forget the exact address, James chapter 1. The anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. I got to remind myself of that all the time, especially with my boys when they were young, especially, but even now, every once in a while. You know, me just wailing on them, whether it's verbally or whatever, you know, that's not, that's not going to, how's that going to accomplish any righteousness with Jesus Christ? So, so be careful. And by the way, what I understand is I understand that I too am prone. I might not be. I might, even be, might not be tempted toward that sin, but I'm tempted toward others. And I understand that I need the patience and the grace and the mercy and the gentleness of God just like they need all that too. The old hymn says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. And if that's not true, I don't know what is. We have this battle with the flesh. All right, so verse 2. Get back to there. Right, bear one of those burdens. And thereby fulfill the law of Christ. So instead of putting somebody down, instead of beating them up, you know, beating them down, he says we're to bear each other's burdens. This is, this is help, one commentator says this, this is helping another believer, sharing his load whenever temptations oppress him or life depresses him. Remember what, what he says in chapter 5, that we're free to love, right? He calls us to freedom. If you look back up at chapter 5, verse 1, key to the whole book, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Freedom from what? Freedom from me, freedom from, from my own stuff, freedom that I have to worry about me, that I have to be God, but I'm so connected, so identified in Jesus Christ that I'm pressed in so much to him that what comes out of me in response is Jesus. Love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Right? What comes out of me is Jesus. What comes, what comes out of me at those moments are not me. I'm so pressed into him. Yeah, you know, I love this verse, John chapter 13, verse 34. Jesus says to them, his disciples, the very last moments literally of his life, last hours of his life, he's hanging out and he says this. He says, I've got a new commandment for you. I know that's my version. I know. I get it. It's up there, right? So you can see it, right? He says, I, I got a new commandment for you, that you love one another. Now, I don't know about you, but if you just stop right there, I, I would have gone, um, Jesus, you even said, that the greatest commandment is to love your Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. You've already told us to love other people. Right? And Jesus, I, I, and this is Patrick's imaginations, okay? I'm just, I'm, I'm embellishing a little bit. Get that. I, I just imagine go, Jesus going, no, no, even as you, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. You, you, you know what? It's not good enough just to love them as you think love should be given. It's not good enough just to love your neighbor as yourself because the reality is there's still a lot of flesh in there. And so Jesus says to his, to his disciples, especially one to another, you know, in the church of Jesus Christ, you're to love each other as I have loved you. And then he says this, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one for another. In other words, the world's going to see that you're followers of me by the way you act toward each other in church. Why do we think the world is so screwed up right now? Why do we think the world is so screwed up right now? Because the church of Jesus Christ won, and, and listen, there's reasons to fight in the church. And they're over the gospel, mainly. But we have walked away from the gospel. We have walked away from, from the Bible being the word of God, that this being his truth, and I'm going to follow his truth. Listen, we've had enough of man's logic. We've had enough of our own arguments. We've had enough of our wisdom and how we need to do things. We need to start understanding who God is and doing it God's way. And that starts with believing this and then saying, okay, if it says it, that's it. Doesn't matter whether I like it or not, it's just what it does. It, it's, he says it, and so I'm going to believe it, because that's how it is. And so, what I'm called to do is, instead of beat up, I'm called to help out. It's, it's not loving to watch a brother so, or a sister, you know, picking up something really super heavy that they can barely go. You know, it's not loving for you to walk by and go, oh, Man, that looks really heavy. 
I am so sorry for you. Who made you do that? That's not right. I'll pray for you. And then keep walking. The loving thing to do is say, how can I help? Well, don't worry about it. This is me. I have to do it. I have to carry it. It's my job. No, I'll help you. Let me help you. How can I help you? How can I walk next to you and help you in this? How can I walk next to you and help you in these temptations? How can I walk next to you and help you in these frustrations? How can I walk next to you? And we don't do that. Why? Because it takes time. And it gets messy. And sometimes they, you know, we try to help and they lash out at us. Right? We have all been scarred by that. If you've been in church and loved people well, you have been scarred by the person that has attacked you back when you've done nothing but love them. And you know what Jesus says? Keep loving. Keep going. Keep caring. Keep coming alongside of them. Keep going out. Well, what keeps us from that? And he points out two errors, two things in us that, that, that stop us from that. Verse 3. He says, if anyone thinks himself, thinks that he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. See, what happens is, is we get to this place, and what could be happening in this church is, you know, uh, the people who have begun to believe this lie from the Judaizers, and maybe there are some that didn't, very easily could be like, see, I knew. You, you better start listening to me. You know, I'm the one who's there. I'm the one who's right. I'm the one who has it. I'm the one who's able. Right? And so, so the first one is conceit. Bible Dictionary says, it's an attitude that breeds intolerance of error in others and causes one to think that he is above failure. An intolerance of error in others and causes one to to think that he is above failure. So we, we get in this place where we go, I, I would never fall for that. I don't know how you could have. How dare you? How dare you? Are you? And then we get back to this question that we've talked a lot about. Are you even a Christian? Listen, to, and, and I love what he says. If you think, there's a lot of words that actually it, it plays in. If Anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing. Guess what? Who's nothing? All of us. Because you know, here's the issue. It's not about I'm worthless. As a matter of fact, I am unworthy before God of anything, but I have great worth before God. As a matter of fact, he died for me. He died that I could have life, that I could be right with my God. He loved me that much. That's how much worth I have to my God. That's how much worth I have, right? But, but get this. At no time do I ever reach a plateau where I have now earned what I have from God. At no time. I am always simply a sinner saved by grace. Always. And that doesn't mean that I'm to, well, see, I can't. I can't challenge anybody else because I have sinned too. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about that. You need to go after them. You need to challenge them. You need to grab them. The problem is, is when you go, oh, I can't believe you would fall for that. I would never. I'm too good. I'm I'm, I'm better than that. And and I'm better than you. And then we put the, the little scarlet letter, whatever that is, on them. And we always look at them and value them in, in view of that because we think that we're better. So instead of bearing the load, we want to just kind of tell somebody how to do, what to do, get better, and then we walk away ourselves. Instead of walking beside of them and helping them to walk that load, all the time going, you know what, I, I could be where you are. I'm not. By the, by the grace of God, I'm not. But, but I could be. And so you know what that means? I'm just going to walk with you. Every step, bearing your load. So conceit is one. The second one is um, um, comparison. The second one is that of comparison. Look what he says in verse 4. He says, but each one must examine his own work, 
And then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another. See, we tend to measure ourselves on this earth, not, not in, in, in view of God, but in view of everybody else. Right? We, tend to, we tend to measure ourselves against other people in the world. So that can be positive or negative. We can think, well, I'm so much better because look at them. So I'm really doing pretty good. I used to, <laughs> forgive us. I don't know if any of you parents ever did this. But when our kids were little and, and they were acting, I, I mean, I, we, we wondered if they had evil spirits at times in them. I mean, like seriously. You know, and they would do things, and, and we would be embarrassed, and we would be crazed, and then we'd go to Bible study. We were often in Bible study with other young couples, with young kids, and, 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 and then they would tell the stories of, like, the same things. And we were like, yes, praise God. I thank God that your kids are crazy, too, because that means that we're not that bad. See, because it was all about us as parents. Oh, my goodness, I can't be bad. I'm a, I was a pastor at the time. I had a Sunday school teacher quit because of one of my kids. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I won't tell you which one. You can decide later. It, it won't be hard. Anyway, um, <laughs> that's, that's my wife up there. <laughs> anyway, anyway. All right, so. We, we compare. We do that as parents. We do that as Christians. I'll have people, and I've told you, I have people walk into it and they go, pa Pastor, I don't even feel like I should be here because I know everybody is right with Jesus and I'm not. You know, because I've been struggling with something. And I, and, and I don't say this out loud. Well, sometimes I say, man, you don't know what I know, and you fit in just perfect here. And, and that's not, now just perfect is not like we're sinners and we don't care. Right? That's, not, that's not what I'm talking about. You fit in perfect because if you're one who wants to be right with God but is struggling on that journey and we just need each other to walk behind and walk next to and walk in front of and all that kind of stuff, then you're in the right place. And I've told you this before. If you're looking for a place with perfect people and the perfect pastor, this is not it. Go. Keep going because this is not it. I struggle. You struggle. We all struggle. What we are right in in this church is that we love Jesus and we want to be like him and we tr strive to do that. And, and I pray that we're like this, that we're one team, one fight. When we struggle, we struggle together. And we're going to walk next to each other I in the heat of it. Not just when it's an illness, but even when it's sin and when it's struggle. And so he says, stop, stop comparing yourself to one another. Because I have some very good news for you this morning. I have some very good news if you're in this place. Um, you don't have to be like any other person in this building. You don't have to be like any other Christian in this world. You don't have to, you don't have to do what somebody else does. You don't have to be what somebody else is. And that doesn't mean you don't look at people and say, man, I'd really love to react or, you know, parent children like they parent or react to things how they react or, you know, godliness. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fact that we measure ourselves against them and then we think that we're less than or greater than because about that. I don't have to please anybody else in this world except for God. I've often said this, right? We perform for an audience of one. And, and listen, you could, be, you could be going just perfectly in line with Jesus, and you could have people throwing rocks at you. Ask Paul. Because they hate you walking in line with Jesus so much. You don't, you don't have to be like anybody else. You don't have to live in the shadow of somebody greater than you. And you don't have to live, uh, ride the wave of, of almost ecstasy in the failures of others. Because at least you're better than that. You don't have to do that. You don't have to be identified by anything but Jesus Christ and him crucified. I can rejoice in the fact that I live out the word in my life in the, in the person of God that he's made me to be. And I, I used this example. I was out at the base today. We had, we had drill this weekend, so I, I had a, a service. I'll, I'll do it at Jones Beach a little bit later on when I do a service for the other servicemen. But, you know, Jimmy Wright, I, I played guitar and sang in the first service today. And um, I played guitar all right, and I sang, uh, okay. 
right? And um, I, I don't look at Jimmy and I don't go, man, he plays guitar and he sings well. God, I just, I just, I don't have it. I don't have it. I'm just not good enough. He's better than me. And I hope he doesn't look at me and go, you know, Patrick stands up and he preaches every Sunday and he's able to do that. And, and, and well, that means I'm not good enough or something like that. No. Right? We're in concert with each other. And I don't mean that in a musical way. Right? But we work together for the glory of God. Right? Because he's been given a gift. And, and to be honest, I mean, that, that, does, that, does that mean he couldn't preach and do pretty good at it? He might. Does that mean I couldn't practice more and get better and take voice lessons and all that? I could. Right? But I've been called to this. And he's been called to that. I didn't ask him if I could do this. Sorry. <laughs> right? We don't have to be in competition with each other. Nobody's better. Nobody's worse. There are people downstairs right now teaching our kids. Right now. And, and every one of you parents is praising God for them right now, right? We praise God for the kind of instruction that they get. Our youth leaders that they do, we, 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 we praise God for the gifts that people have because I can't do everything and neither can you. And I don't have to try. As a matter of fact, that's why he says in verse 5, look what he says. He says, for each one will bear his own load. Now, I know we go, wait a second, isn't that in contradiction to verse 2? Because he said in verse 2 that we're to bear one another's burdens. And here he's saying we're now we're to, to bear our own load. So what's he talking about there? Well, let me, it's not a contradiction because there's two different words for what's being carried. That first word where it says to bear your own burdens, that word means heavy burdens. In other words, it means more than one person should carry. It's something that's weighed them down and they can't, they can't move. It's, it's oppressing them. And we're to come next to them and to help them and to walk with them and to, to carry with them. This word where it says um, that we're to carry our own load, that load there in the Greek is portion. I don't usually say the Greek words, but I like it because it sounds like portion, right? And it means kind of like what you would carry in a pack, like a, like a knapsack, right? In other words... So I have what God has called me to carry. God has not called you to, you know, the, the work that I'm to do, the personality that I have, the giftings that I have, those are mine. And all I, ha I have to carry them out. And when we all carry them out in the church, we're a beautiful thing. When, 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 when the musicians, musician, and the pastor preaches, then we can do well. Right? Then we can be what we're called to be. When the teachers teach and when the, the, the child care workers do that, when the cleaners clean, when everybody does what they're called to do and they stop worrying about what everybody else is doing. The, the biggest problem is, is that we have too many people, even in our church, who sit on the sidelines and go, well, that's really great being served. I like being served. I like it when other people pick up the slack. And you know, too, if you've been here any period of time, if you're called to this church, then you're called to do something here. Not, not what everybody else does, but what God's called you to do. So that's what we're called, right? Brothers and sisters, we're one team, one fight. Especially when it, when it comes to a brother or sister struggling. We're not called to just beat them up and kick them out. There, there could come a time where we separate fellowship because in their unrepentant state, they will refuse, refuse to believe the gospel and begin to propagate other things. And then there might be a, come a time for distancing. But it's never just to beat down or to spank. It's always for restoration. Even in that, it's so they recognize that where they're going is in such that they've broken fellowship with God and us so that they will recognize that and then come back in for full restoration. God is never about just kicking out and spanking. One team, one fight. That's who we are. We're called here at Grace Gospel to exalt Christ in everything we do and to point others to Him. But everybody has a different part in that. Everybody. And so we're called to move in him, to grow him, to love him, to show Christ in such a way. And, and first and foremost, and show him 
by the love that we have and how we take care of one another. And I, wouldn't it be great for people to walk in, and, and they do. I have a lot of people that come in and say, boy, I've, I've just been loved on or I feel like this is home. Wouldn't it be great for people to walk into any church and to say, they, they like each other so much. I, I want to be liked like they're liked, and I want to be liked that, like they're liked here. And all you have to do is come in. That's what we're called to. Let me pray. Father God, I love you. I thank you for the grace of Jesus Christ. I thank you for your mercy and love. I thank you that you are patient and gentle and kind with us, Father. Lord, you've called us to one mission as one team. You've called us as a family of Christ, Father, to be about the business of our Father. And yeah, there's a lot of mon mundane things to do. There's a lot of mundane decisions, and there's decisions that we don't want or people disagree. And, but Father, help us to never forget who we are. And that we're called together in Christ as yours. May we walk that way and may the world see, may the world around us see that we are yours. And that they would even want to be a part of that. Not, not us, but a part of you. Because that's what it is. Father, I love you. Oh, I love you. And I thank you. And I praise you. In Jesus' name. Amen.